This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 47th edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. I have as a special guest today Kevin Tyson. Kevin's a Seattle area resident, former Husky baseball letterman and coach at University of Washington. Kevin has a new book out. It's getting a lot of attention. When it matter most, a forgotten story of America's first Stanley Cup and the war to end all wars, all about the Seattle Metropolitan's hockey franchise and their 1917 Stanley Cup win. Before I go further with Kevin, I want to go over a few housekeeping things here. Uh, Daniel Bellis is my engineer today. Daniel is also the host of the Fresh Juice Show on Rainier Avenue Radio. We have a lot of good stuff going on in our sports department. We have shows hosted by uh, Rick Dupree, Granville Emerson, and Ronald Laurent host a show, Lidline Sports. Mazvita Marari hosts a show on Seattle Sports Weekly. Pat McCarthy Mazvita also co hosts a show on the Seattle Natural Sports Conference. Mark Bryan has a good fitness based show, Fitness Corner. And Juan Cotto and Mike Cobrisi host a new sports show. So we have a lot of good stuff going on in Rainier Avenue right in our space, sports department. Sorry, I spoke a little too fast there. So my guest today, Kevin Tyson, uh, as I mentioned, you're a Husky baseball player, also co-captain of the 99 team, I learned, yeah. and you received a degree from the UW in 99. You got a master's degree in sports administration from Texas, I think in 2004. Kevin was also an assistant coach at Emmons and uh, the UW. And I learned you played in the Anah- Anaheim Angels organization for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, I did. Pretty cool. And I learned you also played baseball in Austria? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So you've done some interesting stuff. <laughs> and your new book, When It Matter Most, is a nonfiction. We're getting a lot of attention right now, as I mentioned earlier, all about the Metropolitans, their 1917 Stanley Cup title. And the book's really good. I, I, I finished most of it this week. Um, and it goes into some Seattle history and some major events going on in the world at that time, including World War I. Uh, Kevin, today we're going to talk about your career a little bit and certainly talk about uh, – your new book, you can follow Kevin Tyson by going to uh, at KTyson, K-T-I-C-N on Twitter. Uh, well, Kevin, I know you're doing a lot of interviews uh, now. You're on uh, uh, Mondo's show on Rainier Avenue Radio. I appreciate mm-hmm. you coming by Sports and Stuff today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, we're going to kind of run the lap around and hit, okay. hit on some potpourri of subjects, and it's fun to have you. Well, Kevin, I uh, like to ask my guests generally a little background question. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I already gave an introduction, but tell us how you got the writing bug. I uh, would say that my stepdad, who moved in when I was three years old, was a writer. So uh, my entire life I've had my writing critiqued. Uh, I think I was probably the only kid in third grade that, you know, had like the ABCs, you know, really like use less words and write more actively and all those good things. And uh, I've sort of laughed. A lot of my teammates were coaches' kids, and I was a writer's kid. So it was always something that I did, not necessarily something that I thought about uh, or thought that I could do well. Uh, and then this just sort of captivated me, and I jumped in, and it all kind of came out. So We have a very crisp writing style, and Thank it's you. a very eloquent writing style. And, Kevin, I, I read about you online a little bit before the show. I think we have met at some point mm-hmm. before, but I read more about you. And I know you had a, a – major health issue come up here. Mm-hmm. How, how are you doing health-wise now? Uh, everything's great. Uh, so I had rectal cancer. I was very lucky that they found it. I was 33 and thought that I had an ulcer or just didn't know what was going on and had some really good doctors that uh, that made sure that they checked and, and they found it. So uh, it was, you know, one of those kind of crazy periods in life. And uh, I was very lucky. You know, I came out of it fairly unscathed. Well, Kevin, one reason I wanted to ask about that is my little show here, I like to occasionally bring up health awareness issues, Mm -hmm. because if even just one person can hear what you had to say, maybe they could help detect that particular cancer issue. Yeah, I mean, and the thing with with colorectal cancer is it's uh, highly curable at early stages, and all all it takes is a colonoscopy to get it, and it's one of those things that's a lot scarier to think about than to actually do, and, uh, you know, for me, it it definitely saved my life, you know, and I would highly recommend... You know, at 40, you get in and, and start doing it. I know it, uh, I think it's at 50 that it's uh, mandatory. Well, or, glad you're feeling better. I, yeah. I appreciate the little uh, health awareness you just yeah. gave. All right. So you're probably familiar with the Boys in the Boat book. Mm-hmm. Boys in the Boat. Great book. For, great book. For some of the listeners, it's a story about the UW rowing team making it to the Berlin Olympics in 1936. The, the, the book goes into all the interesting rowers in the UW team. And it's another forgotten Seattle sports story, mm-hmm. kind of similar to – your story about this 1917 Seattle Metropolitans. Mm-hmm. And the book also goes into Nazism and, and the pending World War II conflict. And so I read your book, and your book is different, but there's also some similarities to Boys in the Boat about, as I mentioned, kind of a forgotten team. And your book also has World War I as a backdrop as to what's going on. Did, did Boys in the Book uh, – Boys in the Boat – Boys in the Boat, did that book influence you in any way in your decision to write uh, What Matter Most? 
Uh, I don't know if it influenced me. Uh, I, mean, I love the book. You know, I do it's too. one of my favorite uh, books that I've ever read. And I talked to Daniel D- James Brown about this, and we sort of laughed. And uh, I, you know, I, honestly, I just wrote the story that was there. And when I when I got in and, and started, uh, I was really intrigued by this team that had won a championship and that most people, including myself, had forgotten about. And uh, as I started to research, I mean, I kind of told people the very first day, the headline as I'm scrolling up to the, the Stanley Cup final, the headline reads, Czar abdicates. And right then, I mean, I just sat there in my chair and stared at the computer and, and almost started laughing. I mean, just a massive world event two days before the first game, read the four games, and then realized that the war declaration happened six days after. And that, more than anything, dictated the, the story. Um, you know, I didn't read Boys in the Boat the entire time that I was writing. And Seabiscuit, Laura Hillenbrand is another one of my favorite authors. She's wonderful. She might be the writer of our generation. And I put those books aside. Just I didn't want to stylistically copy anyone or, or, you know, I wanted it to be my words and my thoughts and all those things. And I think at one point I picked Boys in the Boat up and realized how great of a writer he is and immediately put it back down terrified. So This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with author Kevin Tyson, author of the great new hockey book by the Seattle Metropolitans, When It Matter Most. You can follow Kevin on Twitter at, at K Tyson. Uh, absolutely. Um, Boys and Boats a great book. And your mm-hmm. book, um, Take This as a Compliment, I thought it had some perils to Thank it. you. And so I, I, it kind of brought back a little Boys in the Boat to me in, in some levels. So uh, we're not going to spend the whole time in this interview talking about history. But, hey, sports and stuff. We can, mm-hmm. go, into, we can go into some different mm-hmm. stuff here. And um, I actually went to the World War I National Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, two years ago. Have you been there? I'm, I have not. Yeah, check it out. I, I recommend it to my listeners. It's, it's one of the best museums in the country. And, you know, when you read about World War I, I like history too, but it's kind of a cluster. Mm-hmm. There's so many alliances and broken alliances, and it, it gets kind of confusing, almost like you're reading an SAT, reading comprehension mm-hmm. exam. You're trying to plug all these things in, and it gets confusing. But real quickly, Kevin, what are some things about World War I that you learned in your research for this book that you thought were particularly interesting? Uh so I had a, a background a little bit in World War One. My wife's from Austria, and and uh, you know it it starts there and starts with Franz Ferdinand's assassination. So all those things I knew well. Uh, I didn't know the battles very well. I knew the names of them, and I knew roughly when they occurred. And uh, it was fascinating to actually get in and get to research them. Uh, it was fascinating to know that the tank was used for the first time uh, in the the summer of, of 1917 or 1916. Uh, the thing that stood out the most to me was just the level of, uh, of casualties. I mean, you know, like the Battle of Verdun begins, and like, there's 50,000 casualties on the first day. You know, and you think about, uh, you know, Vietnam, or you think about World War II, and, and just these these massive wars, and the numbers are staggering in World War One compared to the other wars. And you know, it really at that point, life was not valued. You know, and that was one of the things that came out of the war was that soldiers became, you know, people and. And uh, we never really went to that sort of those depths again. Very bloody war. If we had more time, mm-hmm. I'd like to share more with you about it. And we could have a, maybe a discussion sometime more about mm-hmm. it. But I, one part of World War One, this actually came up with my last guest, uh, interestingly. It's, it's pretty amazing that when the, the Duke was assassinated, it, I believe it was the, the Austro-Hungary Duke, mm-hmm. Duke was assassinated, he apparently – Went the wrong way, and you mentioned that in your book. Yeah. And maybe World War One wouldn't have happened if that if he hadn't been assassinated. If he went a slightly different way in the caravan. Or- yeah, I mean, I think that it was going to happen anyways. I think that, sure. that the nationalistic tensions were rising to a, a point that was unstoppable. But yeah, I mean, it was that was just dumb luck. You know, they there was an assassination attempt earlier in the day, they missed, and they're speeding back to get out of there, basically stop at the hospital and made a wrong turn right in front of the lead assassin. We had a good summer of World War One in your book, and I think it, it's a way for the reader to learn more about it. Kevin, real, real quickly, what, what, how did World War One affect the Seattle Metropolitans in that league? Yeah, I mean, I think that it was impossible to avoid it, right? I, I mean, every day, you know, newspaper is the the median of you know for mass media, right? It, that's it. There's no radio, there's no television, and so every day they woke up and read headlines of it. They're their contemporaries, their family members, their friends were all going overseas to fight. Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me the most was the letter that Pete Muldoon got from the front. You know, and that was one of those moments when I found that, that my hair stood on end. And, you know, it really put it into to context of, uh, you know, these were real human beings and it was a, a horrible war. 
Uh, and, and so, you know, these guys like Bernie Morris, obviously, uh, he loses a year of his life to the war. He ends up serving uh, a, a year in Alcatraz for desertion of the U.S. military. And that's a kind of oft talked about uh, story. And then, you know, three of the other Metropolitans go and they, they serve in the military. And Jim Riley is the only one that goes overseas to fight. But it was definitely something that affected everything. No, no doubt about it. I was going to ask about Bernie Morris later, but you, yeah. you brought him up. Uh, real quickly, tell us how the Seattle Metropolitans were formed. We're going back over 100 years ago. But yeah. Tell us a little about how that league, the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, was formed and how the Metropolitans were formed. Yeah, so Lester and Frank Patrick are two of the best players in hockey, and, and they are uh, live in Montreal, and their father is a really successful businessman, and he owns a huge lumber yard, and uh, and he ends up buying a, a big swath of land in Nelson, British Columbia, and he moves the family out and pulls the boys out of hockey. And uh, Frank is just graduating from college. Lester is already a star in the NHA. And, and basically they come out and they create this uh, timber empire and sell it after four years. And, and they're rich and, and intelligent. And, uh, and their dad, Joe, just basically says, you boys can do whatever you want with your money. And they, they start a hockey league. And so they form a three-team league. There's two teams in Vancouver, so New Westminster, Vancouver, and Victoria. And then uh, the league grows, and the New West- Westminster team moves to Portland, and they become the Portland Rosebuds, and then they form the Seattle team. And interesting for me is that the Portland team goes to Chicago and becomes the Blackhawks, and the Victoria team goes to uh, Detroit and becomes the Red Wings. And so two of the original six are rooted in in the Pacific Northwest. Fascinating sports history. I like how you elaborated. And the Pacific Coast Hockey Association folding played a role in the NHL being developed. Yeah, it did, for sure. And really the NHL happens uh, just after the Metropolitans win the Stanley Cup in 1917. So it's formed in November of 17. And it's the NHA, and they have the owner of the Toronto team is not a very nice human being, and uh, I think he's really difficult to to deal with, and the owners of the rest of the teams don't want him around anymore. And so they have a a meeting without him, and they change the name from the NHA to the NHL, and, you know, basically drop his uh, team from the league and form the the NHL. And so in 1919, when the Metropolitans are playing for the Stanley Cup, they're playing the NHL champion, Montreal Canadiens, instead of the NHA champion. So in your book, you also discuss a lot about what was going on in Seattle at that time. Mm-hmm. And I've lived here my whole life. And it's interesting to think about Seattle over 100 years ago. And Seattle was kind of a newer city on the map, mm-hmm. the third largest in the West Coast at that time. Tell us a little bit about the Seattle Metropolitan's hockey fans, a little bit about the demographics. Was it mostly a well-to-do crowd, a working class crowd? Were there any ethnic minorities that watched the games? Tell, tell us about the what kind of a demographic fan base they had. Yeah, I think that it was both wealthy and uh, working class. Uh, you know, I don't think Seattle was a super diverse city back then, and so I think it was probably predominantly white. Uh, and, and it's interesting, uh, you know, 1916 is the first year of the Metropolitans, and I think it was it was mostly working class at that point. And then as the team had a lot of success, you know, then the sort of social elites uh, came and they were in uh, like completely engaged with the team. And in 1919, during that final, there's actually like paragraphs in the society section about, you know, who attended the games and why and things like that. And Alexander Pantages, uh, you know, a lot of people have heard of Pantages theaters. And, and I don't think a lot of people, including myself, understood that that all sprung out of Seattle. And, you know, it was a huge theater empire. Uh, and Pantages is one of the biggest fans. And he sits at center ice for most of the games. And uh, he fronts money for a couple of different uh, competitions that they have between the, the Metropolitans and you know some of their, their opponents. So... Fascinating. Paul Schneider again on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, author Kevin Tyson. So one thing, you know, think about the arena. The Seattle Ice Arena, I guess, was on 5th and University, right mm-hmm. by the Washington Athletic Club and right where the IBM building now exists, mm-hmm. I believe. And just trying to visualize having an arena there, it's kind of surreal in a way. But yeah. tell us a little bit about what the Ice Arena was like. Yeah, so when it was built, it was state-of-the-art. You know, and this is sort of a, a Seattle story through and through, right? I mean, they build this arena. It's state-of-the-art. It's one of the first arenas that has uh, artificial ice-making machine in it to, to really have crisp ice. And uh, it seats 2,500. They pack 3,500 into it for a lot of the games. And it's interesting, in the 1917 final, there's kids sitting on the roof looking through the transoms and through the skylights. 
uh, and quickly the the arena became too small, right? And, and that was the big complaint was they couldn't get enough people in. And arenas, you know, were seven, eight, nine, ten thousand people within three or four years of this one getting built. And then the Fairmont Hotel gets built, and they need a parking garage. And the Metropolitans get kicked out. They're still hugely popular, hugely successful, and they get kicked out of their building with a year left on their lease, and they turn it into a parking garage. Could, could people park for the games okay down there in that era? Uh, I, I believe so. I mean, when you look at old pictures, there's definitely some open lots there, and yeah, it's not that dense. Just, just fascinating thinking there was a, an arena there, right yeah. there. Yeah, that part of downtown. So, okay, there were four teams, I guess, in the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. This may you probably haven't had this question before, but I'm still going to ask it. So, Metropolitans beat the Montreal team in the other league that year to win the Stanley Cup. And as American sports fans, Kevin, we're used to having leagues a lot more than four teams. Um, I guess in theory, the fewer teams, maybe the better the players. Other hand, competition's more limited mm-hmm. with the, with when you have only like four teams. So another thing in that era is you know, people of color couldn't play in professional mm-hmm. sports mm-hmm. leagues. So I asked a baseball story I had on last week, a similar question. How do you measure, not to, not to throw a stinker at the amazing mm-hmm. title they had, but how do you measure those factors, the, the, just a four-team league and segregation evaluating the full significance of their 1917 title? Yeah, so, I mean, number one, I think that the population is significantly less than it is today, right? And so I don't know what the math is That's on good point. You know, population for four teams, you know, in overall pop, or I guess there's eight professional teams. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, per capita, it's probably fairly similar. Uh, and, you know, the, the thing, I, I haven't been asked that question specifically, but I've been asked it in a different way. And, you know, like, how do you equate this to what's happening today? And my response to it is, like, as a former athlete or a coach, I don't view athletics through, you know, the prism of being a fan and, and the enjoyment that I derive from it and all those things. I view it from, like, the athlete's perspective and, and how it affects their lives and changes their lives. And the the thing that I've said repeatedly with this is – Every second that they were on the ice meant just as much to them in 1917 as it does to players today. No doubt. So to me, it equates the same. A championship's a championship. I think it's one of the most difficult things to achieve. Uh, there's so much luck involved, so many things outside of your control, and you know what these guys did was special. You know, and to really like, they didn't back their way into this thing either. It was the the best uh, pennant race in the history of the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. It comes down the last day against one of the greatest teams in hockey, and then they have to face the Montreal Canadiens. They're the Yankees, right? They're the single best. It was called the World Series of Hockey. In that it was era called too. the World Series. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I learned that in your book. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a yeah, that's a uh, interesting answer you gave, and a very fair answer. But I was just sort of thinking that through as I was preparing for your interview mm-hmm. about the smaller league. And again, we have to keep in mind the segregation that era too. Mm-hmm. A lot of people of color just couldn't play at all in yeah. sports. But but you're, I, I get where you're going. Okay, there's one figure that's focused heavily in your book, and he seemed like a fascinating guy. Pete Muldoon, mm-hmm. the head coach, I, the, he was a 29-year-old coach of the 1917 Stanley Cup South mm-hmm. Metropolitan's team. And I believe he's still the youngest coach ever yeah. coached a Stanley Cup hockey team. Mm-hmm. So this is, a, this is a tough question. I'm still going to ask it. You're a sports guy. I am as mm-hmm. well. And when you think of major sports coaches in this town, we have Lenny Wilkins, Don James, Gil Doby, I think, mm-hmm. who, who I think Muldoon and him knew each other when Doby mm-hmm. was a UW coach that era. Uh, Pete Carroll, the name goes on. How when you think of when people think of great Seattle coaches, Muldoon's name really comes up. Mm-hmm. Do you put him in that top five ish group? A- absolutely. I mean, without a doubt. I you would know? too. I mean, maybe at the top of that group. Uh, and he certainly was unbelievably famous until really the late forties. And I think part of the issue is he dies very young. So he dies in nineteen twenty nine. He has a heart attack. It's tragic. When he dies. Uh, Royal Brougham uh, puts Pete in the category of uh, the person that starts the New York Yankees and the person that starts the Montreal Canadiens as the three most influential people in sports in, in North America, right? I mean, like a guy in Seattle, Washington in 1929 is considered one of the three most influential people in the continent in sports. Muldoon right? was Muldoon. In, that era, in the late yes. 20s. That's amazing. And, you know, when he dies in the Seattle Times, the headline above where it says sports says Pete Muldoon dies. And in the, in the PI, they don't put sports on the front page uh, back in those days. When he dies in the, the day he dies in the PI, it's uh, front page, center column above the fold. So it is the main story in the newspaper that day is his death. And, I mean, he is a legendary figure. You know, you bring up some points, Kevin. This is a little fun little sports junkie talk. But you can make an argument that Pete Muldoon may be the most significant coach mm-hmm. ever to come Absolutely. to Seattle. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a – 
that is, uh, you know, just thinking more about it. Um, that's and Royal Brom talked a lot about the vacuum that was created when he passed away, you know, and it was, you know, Jeff Baker wrote a piece about that, you know, it's tragic that it's taken so long for an NHL team to come. And, and Royal Brom then just basically said that, you know, his death was so tragic in the, the community, right? And, and Muldoon built the Mercer Arena. That was him building that to try and bring hockey back. And he passed away right after it was finished. Paul Schneiderman, again, on Sports and Stuff, you're just tuning in with uh, Kevin Tyson talking about his uh, great new book, uh, When It Mattered, and just going into hockey, all sorts of subjects. So I believe um, there's a bunch of players you write about in your book, and these are new names for me, mm-hmm. like Frank Foyston, Jack Walker, Coley Wilson, Bernie Morris. You mentioned a little about Bernie's uh, background a minute ago. I, I believe Foyston was, was the league MVP mm-hmm. that year. W- w- would you put Frank Foyston as the greatest Seattle Metropolitans player ever? If you yeah, I mean, he's the first guy. He's the first Western player ever inducted in the Hall of Fame. He goes wow. in 1958. I mean, he's Joe Montana. He's like he's literally the sort of best overall guy that makes the magic happen. Yeah, there were some interesting players you mentioned, and, and it was fun to read about them and their, their backgrounds. But, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, or early in the interview, about Bernie Morris. And when I read about Bernie Morris in your book, he struck me as a, as a real tragic figure. Mm-hmm. That it seemed like his life took some very unfortunate turns after the 1917 mm-hmm. championship. And there was a draft evasion issue that you, met, you mm-hmm. mentioned that came up during World War I. Um, I also read that he never made the Hockey Hall of Fame, unlike several other players, mm-hmm. including Pete Muldoon. And his obituary was never apparently covered in the mm-hmm. Seattle media. Did, did Morris ever ha- come to peace at all with what happened to his life? I don't think so. I mean, I, I honestly think that uh, it's really hard to overcome the things that, that he had to deal with as a child. You know, And uh, it was interesting as I interviewed uh, Frank Voiston's daughter the first time. You know, she said you know, they had a falling out late in life. You know, and, and Frank was his rock. He was the person that held it together. And, and you, know, you just sort of think that, that Bernie's demons just never left him and, and he couldn't control them. And, you know, it happened in their 60s and they both passed away uh, shortly thereafter. And, and that was part of the thing with Bernie is like, you know, his, his second uh, marriage dissolved and his friendship with Foyston and he just died in obscurity. It's tragic. This may be a leap, but I'll still ask a question. I mean, was Bernie Morris kind of like Muhammad Ali of his era and refusing to go to participate in a war? I mean, no, 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 not at all. So, not at all. Uh, so he's a Canadian citizen, and there's a, a treaty that's signed that says that all Canadian citizens living in America are subject to the U.S. draft, right. and all American citizens in, in Canada are subject to the Canadian draft. And so he gets basically drafted six days before the armistice is signed. They send his draft summons to his house in Seattle. He's not there. He's in British Columbia. And so he doesn't show for his uh, his physical. They immediately charge him. He arrives two weeks later for the start of practice, explains to them that he was in Vancouver. They say, okay, that's fine. We'll waive this. It's That's understandable. And then he's getting divorced from his first wife in February of that year. And he gives a deposition and says that he lives in Seattle and his wife will not come out to Seattle with him. She stays in Moose Jaw where she lives. And the military sees that and basically charges him and says – you know, you told us that you were living in British Columbia. You told a judge under, you know, uh, in a deposition that you lived in Seattle. Something's up. You're under arrest. And so that's how the whole he thing wasn't a conscientious objector. No. Nothing like that. Okay. No. Okay. He okay. just failed to do the paperwork correctly. Well, that's the about, about interviewing. You may ask a question that yeah. may not be the best question, but you can still get an interesting answer. Yeah, know, I mean, so. to me, that's a great answer. It just showed his psyche, too, right? He's a guy that if he's on the ice, it's magic. And every other aspect of his life, he can't manage it. You know, and it's just, again, it's just those demons. He's orphaned since he's eight years old. You yeah. know, when I read your book, Kevin, I, it, I noticed that quite a few of the figures in the book did die young. And mm-hmm. as I mentioned earlier, Bernie Morris struck me as the most tragic figure mm-hmm. of, the, of the people you profile in the book. Absolutely. On many levels, yeah. Uh, Paul Schneider again. we got a couple minutes left on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, Kevin Tyson, author of What It Mattered Most, but 1917, So Metropolitans, and the Stanley Cup title. Um, you mentioned this in your book a little bit. Maybe you can expand that it was apparently a pretty big deal for Seattle in 1917 to host a hockey Stanley Cup championship series. Um, do you think that that championship series helped put Seattle on the map as a major league city, or was it more of a temporary one-time thing that came into the town? You know, it's hard to really gauge what the national reaction was. Uh, I know uh, civically within Seattle, it was huge. It, it, 
this was a community that was absolutely just starving for attention. And, you know, the Smith Tower has just been finished, right, which is really just a big symbol of, you know, we're here, we've arrived. Uh, it was interesting. I didn't work this into the book. I wanted to. But there's a series of articles that get written every Monday in January of 1917, and, and it's a civic leader imploring the rest of the citizens to band together to make Seattle the, the major West Coast city, right? And it's, you know, uh, Los Angeles is growing. San Francisco is huge. Portland's growing. Like, let's be the biggest city. You could tell it was a city that just that needed something to to – uh, to, to jump behind and, and be part of. And just like the Seahawks were or the Sounders were or the Sonics were, you know, it's like winning championships brings cities together. Big deal for the city over 100 years ago. Yeah. So, Kevin, give me your take. You just wrote a book about uh, the hockey franchise. I know your ba- ba- background is more baseball, but you've certainly learned a lot about hockey. Do you have any ideas how the, C- the new CLNHL team, which is coming in two years, should honor and recognize the 1917 Seattle Metropolitans? Would you support having a hockey museum with the new key arena remodel? Give, give us your thoughts on how you like to see the new franchise honor this team. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're doing all the right things already. You know, I mean, like you go into the preview center and there's a, a Metropolitans jersey there that's hanging up. There's Coley Wilson skates. Uh, I think that the most likely the banners will be hung, and they should, right? I mean, banners are for communities, not for a uh, defunct franchise to, you know, to to honor, right? I mean, like there are grandkids that still live here and great grandkids, and they deserve to go in and, and see their their uh, ancestors' accomplishments. And so, I think that the banners will be hung. I've heard rumors that they might use the S with the Seattle uh, inside of it, and I think that that would be phenomenal. That would be a great tribute to the the Metropolitans franchise. I don't think that the team will be named Metropolitans, you know, and I don't really have an opinion on that either. I just uh, I think that the more important thing is that they honor the legacy of these players. I'd love to see statues of the Hall of Famers oh, outside yeah. of the arena. I mean, these guys spent their entire careers in Seattle. They were Hall of Famers because of what they did in Seattle. It wasn't like a stop on the way to somewhere else. I agree uh, with you. It'd be fun if the history got preserved yeah. and recognized. That and way. I think they're going to. I mean, I think uh, you know, I think Todd Lywicki is is you know good of a human being as you can you can be, and, and he did phenomenal things with the Seahawks and everywhere he's been. He's been able to really uh, you know get the the franchise ingratiated into the community so i had dave Tippett on my show heck of a guy mm-hmm. great guy great guy i think they got a great group mm-hmm. the, the franchise together well kevin we're kind of winding down i don't think we have a whole lot of time left um why don't you share a little bit about what's in the future for kevin tyson <laughs> Uh, you know, I still coach a baseball team, and and so Good for uh, I'm getting ready for the baseball the summer baseball season to start. And uh, as I do that, I think I'll, I'll start to think about what I want to do next. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to write another book. You know, I mean, it definitely is something where I need some time to decompress. And uh, I think if I found another story that I was as passionate about as this, I would certainly do it again. And uh, if I don't, I'm not going to force it and write something for the sake of writing it. So we're also you're also a busy guy with 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 three kids, I believe. Yeah, you? three kids and a wife. Yeah, and a wife and yeah, what's and, going on? And so it's good. I mean, I really like enjoy it. I loved bringing the story back to life. You know, I, I just I love Seattle sports. I love the history of our community, and it was fun to kind of bring this one back. What, would you ever? consider writing a book about another kind of obscure or lesser-known sales sports story? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, there's part of me that, that would love to write something on Fred and Bill Hutchinson. You know, I, I would consider Bill Hutchinson sort of a hero of mine. And Absolutely. so many people don't know who he is. They know Fred through the Cancer Research Center, and they don't know what an incredible human being Bill was and what a phenomenal baseball player he is. Tubby Graves called him the best player, best Husky player of the first half of the 20th century. Well, I'm yeah. a big Hutch supporter, Hutch yeah. Monday supporter. Well, Cameron, thank you so much for coming on Sports. I really yeah. enjoyed meeting you and having you come on. Today. Thanks for having me on. Me too.